Welcome. I'm Steve Tackett of Grace Bible Network. We are very pleased to welcome you to this video class. We are proud of the quality of Grace Bible Network's online Bible studies and recordings available on both our website and YouTube. Whether you watch them online or just listen to the audio portion on your commute to work, we are glad you're here. Please enjoy the recording. Okay, welcome to the Monday night Bible study. And our subject for tonight is understanding forgiveness from the dispensational perspective. And so our first scripture is going to be Zechariah chapter 8, if you want to turn there. And we'll begin with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you so much that we have your word perfect in our language and that by studying it, we can understand uh, your mind, your will, your heart, your purpose, your character, and everything you want us to know. Everything that we need to know is contained in your word. We thank you for that. We pray as we come to it tonight, uh, as we look at it, study it, that we come to the understanding you would have us to have so that we are edified in the faith our faith is strengthened and that we're better prepared to serve you because of that. And we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Zechariah chapter 8. Now, when we read Zechariah chapter 8, what we're reading about is what the kingdom on earth will be like when Christ returns. And we read in chapter 8, verse 1, Again, the word of the Lord of hosts came to me, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I was jealous for Zion with great jealousy, and I was jealous for her with great fury. Thus saith the Lord, I am returned unto Zion, and I will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem, and Jerusalem shall be called a city of truth. And the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, there shall yet old men and old women dwell in the streets of Jerusalem, and every man with his staff in his hand for very age, and the streets of the city shall be full of boys and girls playing in the streets thereof. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, if it be marvelous in the eyes of the remnant of this people in these days, should it also be marvelous in mine eyes, saith the Lord of hosts? Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will save my people, and there he's specifically referring to Israel, I will save my people from the east country and from the west country, and I will bring them, and they shall dwell in the midst of Jerusalem, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God in truth and in righteousness. Verse 9, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Let your hands be strong, ye that hear in these days these, uh, these days, these words by the mouth of the prophets, which were in the day that the foundation of the house of the Lord of hosts was laid, that the temple might be built. Verse 10, for be, before these days, there was no hire for man, nor any hire for beast, neither was there any peace to him that went out or came in because of the affliction. For I set all men, everyone, against his neighbor. But now I will not be unto the residue of this people as in the former days, saith Lord of hosts. For the seed, referring to Israel, the seed of Abraham, the seed shall be prosperous, the vine shall give her fruit, and the ground shall give her increase, and the heavens shall give her their due. And I will cause the remnant of this people to possess all things. Now, I want you to look at um, verse 17. And none, and let, excuse me, and let none of, of you imagine evil in your hearts against his neighbor. And love no false oath, for all these are things that I hate, saith the Lord. So he says in verse 17, as a requirement to be in that kingdom that will be on the earth, is that 
that that you let none of you imagine evil in your hearts against your neighbor. And that has to do, of course, with unforgiveness, holding a grudge, being resentful, and that type of thing. If you back up to chapter 7 of Zechariah, you see that is, the, again, that is the qualification for being in that kingdom. Um, look at chapter, Zechariah chapter 7, and look with me to verse 9. Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Execute true judgment, and show mercy and compassions every man to his brother, and oppress not the widow, nor the fatherless, the stranger, nor the poor, and let none of you imagine evil against his brother in your heart. Like so, forgiveness of your neighbor and your brother is absolutely necessary to be a part of God's kingdom that's going to be here on the earth in the future. Now, that ties in very well with what the Lord taught the nation Israel during his earthly ministry. Look at Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18. Look at verse 21. Matthew 18 verse 21. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Till seven times? Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king which would take account of his servants. And now what we're going to read in this parable, and I'm sure most of you are familiar with this, well, what we're going to read in this parable is the Lord explaining the importance of forgiveness of your brother to enter into that kingdom. Verse 23, Therefore is the kingdom of heaven like unto a certain king which would take account of his servants. And when he had began or when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him, which owed him 10,000 talents. But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold and his wife and children and all that they had in payment be made. The servant therefore fell down and worshiped him saying, Lord, have patience with me, I will repay thee all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. And remember, the definition of forgiveness is to not collect a debt that is owed you. Forgiveness is not a feeling. Forgiveness, forgiveness is not not being offended but forgiveness is choosing not to collect on a debt that is owed you. Let's read on. Look at verse 27 again. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence, and he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me th that thou owest. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And he would not, but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. 
Then his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt, because thou desirest me. Shouldest not thou also have compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And his Lord was wroth, and delivered him to the tormentors, till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall all my, excuse me, so likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. Now that ties in, of course, with the so-called Lord's Prayer. If you turn to Matthew chapter 6, Matthew chapter 6, Christ tells his apostles to pray after this manner. And now he says to pray after this manner. Uh, he doesn't tell them they have to quote this word for word, but to, to pray after this manner. And they're not to repeat things over and over again like the heathen do. If you look at verse 5 of Matthew chapter 6, it says, And when thou prayest, thou shalt shall not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to, to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to the, thy father which is in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Well, when ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask. After this manner, therefore, pray ye. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. And so what is the prayer contain? The prayer contains, and this, of course, this lesson is not strictly about prayer. It's about forgiveness. But understand the context. It's very important that we understand the context of what we're reading. He tells them to pray for the kingdom to come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. And that's when the kingdom comes. When the kingdom comes to earth, It'll be just like we read about there back in, in Zechariah chapter 8. The Lord himself will physically be on the earth in Jerusalem, ruling and reigning over this planet. That is when the kingdom will come to earth. And so Christ tells his disciples to pray for that kingdom to come to earth. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and of course, the reason why you have to pray for your daily bread is because you won't be able to buy or sell during the tribulation. Because the tribulation precedes the coming of the kingdom. And forgive our debtors as we forgive, forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. Go down to verse 15. But if we forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your father forgive your trespasses. So you see, again, forgiveness to get into the kingdom that will be on the earth requires that you forgive your brother. That is the qualification. You don't have forgiveness unless you forgive your brother. Now, that would be motivation to forgive, but there's another motivation that they have to forgive. If you look at verse, um, if you go back to Matthew chapter 18, go back there, Matthew chapter 18. Um, Well, actually, let's let's skip Matthew chapter 18, and uh, we'll just edit that out. Um, let's go to 1 John chapter 3. 
1 John chapter 3. What I want you to see here in 1 John chapter 3 is a statement that John makes about that day when they will enter into the kingdom. And he says in 1 John chapter 3, verse 3, and every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. And what's he referring to? If you go back to verse 2, it says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And having that hope is what purifies the believer. And so knowing, knowing what God has in store for the nation Israel, for, for the believing nation of Israel, what he has in store for them in keeping his promises to them for that future kingdom, that's the motivation that they would have to forgive their brother. Not only to be forgiven, but knowing what God has in store for them, knowing what they've got to look forward to in that kingdom gives them motivation to forgive their brother. If you look at 1 John again and look at chapter 2 and look at verse 27, 1 John chapter 2, verse 27. But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you, and ye need not that any man teach you. But as the same anointing teacheth you all things, and is truth, and is no lie, even as it is taught, hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. So they'll have this anointing. They'll have this anointing as they go through the tribulation. And um, it's very important that we understand that these letters that are written by the, the whoever wrote Hebrews, it was written to the Hebrews, whoever, uh, you know, James wrote to the 12 tribes of Israel. And so all these letters from Hebrews to Revelation is directed specifically at those believing Jews that have to go through the tribulation before the re return of Christ and the setting up of the kingdom that was promised them. And so what the Lord does for the believing remnant of Israel during that time is he gives them an anointing. He gives them anointing of the Holy Spirit so they can do his will, have the empowerment, the spiritual empowerment to do his will. And they don't have to be taught. They're taught by God to, to love their brother. And so they have this anointing. But I want you to look at something else also as well. Um, look at look at the book of Luke, Luke chapter one. Luke chapter one. Luke chapter 1, look at what Zacharias uh, prophesies by the Holy Ghost. It says in verse 67 of Luke chapter 1, And his father Zacharias was filled with the Holy Ghost and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he had visited and redeemed his people, and hath raised up an horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spake by the mouth of all his holy prophets, which have been since the world began, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us, to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. The oath which he sware to our father Abraham, 
that he would grant unto us that we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. And thou, child, shalt be called the prophet of the highest, speaking of John the Baptist, for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation unto his people by their mission of their sins, through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high hath visited us. And so this is further motivation for the people of Israel to forgive their brother, to forgive their neighbor. But you notice what was missing from all these verses about the motivation for forgiveness? What was missing? Did you pick up on that? What was not there? What was not said? There was nothing said about the cross of Christ. Nothing said. As a matter of fact, when you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you, and you read it carefully, pay attention to everything that's said, you will realize that the Lord Jesus Christ never mentioned his death, burial, and resurrection until towards the end of his earthly ministry, shortly before he went to the cross. And when he makes it known to his disciples, especially Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the other apostles, when he makes it known, they have no idea what he's talking about. What do you mean you're going to go die on the cross? Why would you do that? You see, they don't understand forgiveness on the basis of the cross. That's not understood until long after his resurrection. Let's turn to... Let's turn to the first message in Scripture that talks about someone having forgiveness on the basis of what Christ did on the cross. And we have to find that we have to go all the way to Acts 13. Acts 13. In Acts 13, the Apostle Paul is preaching, and he says, beginning at verse 16, Acts 13, verse 16, Then Paul stood up and beckoning with his hand said, Men of Israel and ye that fear God, give audience. The God of this people of Israel chose our fathers and exalted the people when they dwelt as strangers in the land of Egypt. And with an high arm brought he them out of it. And about the time of 40 years suffered he their manners in the wilderness. And when he had, excuse me, and when he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan, he divided their land to them by lot. And after that, he had gave unto them judges about the space of 450 years until Samuel the prophet. And afterward, they desired a king. And God gave them Saul, the son of Sis, a man of the tribe of Benjamin by the space of 40 years. And when he had removed him, he raised up unto him David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. Verse 23, of this man's seed hath God, according to his promise, raised unto Israel a savior, Jesus. So understand what's going on here. These Jews are hearing this message for the first time. Paul is explaining to them for the first time who Jesus is. Now, you say, well, aren't there lots of Old Testament prophecies about Christ? Yes, there are. But they weren't understood. 
They were not understood. Now, let's jump ahead in chapter 13 of Acts to verse 34. Look at verse 33. God hath fulfilled the same unto us, their children, in that he hath raised up Jesus again, as it is also written in the second Psalm, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And as concerning that he had raised him from the dead, now no more to return to corruption. He said on this wise, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Wherefore he saith also in another Psalm, Thou shalt not suffer thine holy one to see corruption. For David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell on sleep and was laid unto his fathers and saw corruption. But he whom God raised again saw no corruption. Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man, through Christ, is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. And by him all that believe are justified from all things, which ye could not be justified by the law of Moses. See, they're hearing this message for the first time. They're hearing for the very first time that Christ, the one that was crucified and rose from the dead, is through him you have forgiveness of sins and you no longer are able to be, or I should say, could not be justified by the law of Moses, verse 39. They need to understand that. But they're hearing this for the first time. Now, let's go back to Acts chapter 2 for just a minute. Let's go to Acts chapter 2. Look at what Peter preaches to Israel in Acts chapter 2. He says a very similar thing that Paul said in Acts chapter 13. Peter says in Acts chapter 2, about Christ, he says, verse 29, Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him, that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He seen this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ. Notice how Peter has to explain this to his audience. Those people, those Jews that had the Old Testament prophets, he has to explain to them who Christ is from those Old Testament prophets. They don't understand those prophecies. Verse 31, he's seen this spake before of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell. Neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus hath God raised up where we are all witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth this which ye now see and hear. For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand till I make thy foes thy footstool. That is a prophecy about Christ's return to earth when he sets up his kingdom. Verse 36, therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made this same Jesus whom have crucified both Lord and Christ. Now, what is the plan of salvation that Peter preaches here? Verse 37, now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? What shall we do in the light of the fact that we have crucified our Messiah? What do we do? Verse 38, then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now I want you to pause right there just for a minute. He says, for the remission of sins, not the forgiveness. Rem when something is remission, it's just not active. But to have them completely forgiven and blotted out, that's an entirely different thing. 
look at chapter 3, Acts chapter 3. Peter continues to preach to the Jews, and he says here in Acts chapter 3, verse 19, Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Re referring to the re Christ when Christ physically returns to earth. So he's saying that their sins can be remitted now, but they won't be blotted out until when? According to the verse when Christ returns. Look at verse 20. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things. What is Christ going to do when he comes back to earth? He's going to restore everything to the way it's supposed to be. To the restitution of all things which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. So that was the promise to the nation Israel. Christ would come to Israel, be their Messiah, and to restore the kingdom to Israel. And the kingdom of heaven would be on the earth. And then they would have their sins blotted out. Now. With that in mind, let's now go to let's now go to Romans, Romans chapter four. Romans chapter four. Romans chapter 4, and let's look at speaking about Father Abraham. And he says in verse 20, He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, what God had promised, he was able also to perform. And therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. The forgiveness of our sins was by the cross, and his resurrection from the dead is for our justification. Look at look at 2 Corinthians chapter 2. 2 Corinthians and chapter 2. Second Corinthians chapter 2. Paul says to the church in this dispensation of grace, he says in verse 10 of chapter 2, To whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave it in the person of Christ. See, we can now forgive and we have the privilege of forgiving others based upon the forgiveness that we have in Christ. We're not forgiving people to be forgiven. We're not waiting for our sins to be blotted out at the return of Christ. Our sins are already forgiven and they're already blotted out. So Paul is teaching us a lesson here in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 about the fact we, that we need to forgive on the basis of the fact we've been forgiven. 
we have been completely and totally forgiven of all sin, past, present, and future. And on that basis, the basis of what Christ did for us, we now should forgive our brothers. Look at Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. That's referring to the rapture. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath, past tense, forgiven you. So you're already forgiven. And that is what should be our motivation for forgiving others, not to be forgiven, not because we're waiting for the day when God is going to save us from our enemies, no, our motivation for forgiving is that we're already forgiven. Look at Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2, verse 10. And ye are complete in him, that's in Christ, Ye are complete in Christ, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. In other words, it's a spiritual circumcision in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism. And of course, that's also a spiritual baptism. It's not a physical baptism. Wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who has raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened, made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Our sins are not just in remission. They're already forgiven. And I mentioned earlier that our sins are blotted out. That's true. But I want you to notice how they're blotted out. Look at verse 14. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to, to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. So what did God do? When Christ, our Savior, is hanging there in agony on the cross for our sins, he blotted out the handwriting of ordinances. That's the law. He blotted out the handwriting of ordinances, took it out of the way, and nailed it to his cross. What does that mean for us? If you take the law away, then you have no transgression. Go back to, go to Romans chapter 5 again. Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. Look at verse 8. Romans chapter 5, verse 8. But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So we didn't have to stop sinning for Christ to pay the price for our sin. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. In other words, he's not going to collect the debt that's owed him by our sin. No, he's saved us from that collection of that debt. Verse 10, 
For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom now we have received the atonement. We've already see, received the atonement. Verse 12, wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men for all of sin. Now notice verse 13, for until the law, sin was in the world. So sin has always been, ever since Adam and Eve disobeyed God in the garden, sin has been in the world. But notice, but sin is not imputed where there is no law. Okay, now go back to Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. So when he says in verse 14 of Colossians chapter 2, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross, what has he done there? He removes the law. He takes the law out of the way so, so, the, so that even though we still sin, that sin is not imputed to us because what? The law has been blotted out. Now, remember, though, the law has only been blotted out temporarily during the dispensation of grace. Once the dispensation of grace has come to an end, Things go back to, to the way they were before with the prophetic program in Israel and judging man on the basis of the law. Now, if you don't receive Christ as your personal savior, you will also be judged by the law. That's the, that's the thing you need to understand. If you haven't trusted Christ as your savior, if you haven't recognized that you are a sinner on your way to hell, the hell you deserve, and trust Christ's payment for your sin, then guess what's going to happen? You will still be judged by the law because you have not received the free gift of salvation. You decided, I don't need to be saved. I don't need the free gift of salvation. I'm okay on my own. Well, if you die like that, you're going to be sadly mistaken because you're going to end up being judged by the law. You're going to be, end up being judged by your works and you'll not make it into heaven. You'll be in hell. So what Jesus did on the cross for us is he took the law out of the way so sin would not be imputed to us. He became, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, he became sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He became our sin and he blotted out the law. So the law could not be imputed to us or that sin would not be imputed to us because he took the law out of the way, nailing it to his cross. So we have more than forgiveness from Christ, as if that wasn't enough. That's so amazing, so wonderful that we have all of our sins, past, present, and future, forgiven. But he's done so much more for us than just forgiven us. He has actually made us righteous. He has justified us by his blood. And he has taken the law out of the picture entirely for us so we have this amazing amazing uh, position in Christ uh, that is beyond comprehension it's just an amazing thing that he's done for us so you see the difference there when you're talking about forgiveness, the, the forgiveness we have in Christ is 100% complete. It's not based upon you, you confessing your sins because the sin is already forgiven. People go to 1 John 
First John one, uh, go to First John with me. First John one nine. First John, um, uh, chapter one, verse nine. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all right, unrighteousness. That is a condition that John is saying that has to be met for your sins to be forgiven. You must confess the sins. That's what they. That's what that was required under the law of Moses. If you go back and read Leviticus, read the book of Numbers, look at all those verses where it says you must confess the sin for it to be forgiven. That's the law program. That's why. John is not writing to the church, the body of Christ. John is writing to the believing remnant of Israel who have to go through the tribulation to, in order to get into the kingdom that was promised to them in the Old Testament. And they must obey these Old Testament precepts of confessing sin in order to be forgiven. This is not a system uh, that teaches us that we're on some kind of a short account with God. No, all of our sins have already been forgiven. We don't confess our sins to be forgiven. They're already forgiven and the law is not in place today. Did you know over 21 times Paul tells us in his letters that we're not under the law, but we're under grace? Yeah, 21 times he tells us in his letters that we're not under the law, but we're under grace. And yet, much of the church still thinks they're under the law. It's a very sad situation. We need to understand our motivation for forgiving is that we've been completely forgiven. Well, what about the future? What about, what about when the kingdom does come and the kingdom is set up and and everything is in place and Christ is reigning for a thousand years on the earth, what happens then? Well, look at the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter, Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21. It's talking about the new Jerusalem. In, in Revelation chapter 21, it's talking about the new Jerusalem that comes down out of heaven. And he talks about the 12 tribes living in, 12 tribes of Israel living in that new Jerusalem. And he says, and of course this is towards the end of the thousand year reign of Christ. It says in verse 22 of Revelation 21, and I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of theirs do bring their glory and honor unto it, into it. And the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there. And they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. You see, there'll be no more sin there. There'll be no more sin. So there won't be the need to forgive the sin because the sin is gone. God has already put down all rebellion against him. He just has destroyed his enemies and is ruling and reigning on the earth. And he's eliminated all sin. The only people that will be walking on the earth in the millennial reign of Christ are those who are living in obedience to God every day. Look at chapter 22. And he showed me a pure river of, of water of life, clear as crystal, 
proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. And in the midst of the street of it, on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the trees were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse. Why won't there be any more of a curse? There won't be any more curse because there'll be no more sin. Remember why Adam and why there was a curse put on the earth? Because Adam and Eve disobeyed God. And so God cursed the earth. But in the millennial reign, there'll be no more curse. God will take the curse away. But the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. And they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. And there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. So he's put down our rebellion. There's no more sin. There's no more curse. No need to forgive anybody. It will be heaven on earth. So that's my lesson on understanding forgiveness from the dispensational perspective. So we'll now open it up to any comments or questions that you have. Thanks for listening. Hello again. Hope you enjoyed the recording. If you liked it, would you please help us with our YouTube ratings? Would you hit the like button and subscribe to our channel? You can unsubscribe anytime you like. It helps us reach more people with the teaching of the word rightly divided. For more information on our online Bible classes, please check our website at www.gracebiblenetwork.org. We are a nonprofit entity supported by our ministry partners, and we will never solicit donations. This is God's ministry, and he always provides for our needs. Remember that God's grace is a gift itself, freely given us through his son. His grace is sufficient to save you from all your sins. But only if you have faith in what Christ has already completed for you on your behalf. He died for our sins, was buried, and rose again the third day for our justification. Thank you very much.